Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this engaging cooking show. Today we are featuring Chef Brendan Pelly of Zebra's Bistro and Wine Bar. He will be showing us how to make this delicious colorful dish in front of me. It is a honey brine pork tenderloin in a brown butter spatzel, Brussels sprouts, poached apples in an apple cider demi-glace. Can't wait to try this dish. And later on, we'll have other segments that you will find very interesting and engaging. We are here at Motherbrook Arts and Community Center in Dedham. So let's go over to Chef Brendan and Joe Murphy, my co-host, to learn how to make this delicious dish. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy, and this show is produced by the Chef's Table Foundation. The foundation is dedicated to supporting homeless U.S. veterans and young adults, 18 years old or a bit older, as long as they have a high school diploma or a GED equivalency. And our objective and our mission is to pay for culinary school educations at a wonderful school in Boston next year. Having said that, this show is designed to be instructional and to show that you can have fun cooking. And if you are a home cook, you will hopefully pick up some great tips from our chef tonight. And we have a wonderful chef with a great reputation. And his name is Chef Brendan Pele. He's with the Zebra Wine Bar in Bistro. Bistro and Wine Bar. Ah, that's what I was getting <laughs> a little confused. Okay. And that's in Medfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and why don't you talk about, Chef, what we're gonna cook tonight? Okay, uh, first, thanks for having me on the show. I'm really okay. excited to be here. And tonight we're going to cook a honey brined pork tenderloin with brown butter spetzel, Brussels sprouts, and an apple cider reduction with some poached apples. Oh, sounds great. Well, there's some things we haven't seen before, poaching, which is something you can discuss mm -hmm. about what that technique is in the style of cooking. Uh, but what we always start off with, Chef, is I'm trying to make an impression on the home chef, mise en place. Mm -hmm. And mise en place is a French term, and it means everything in its place. So that once you're ready to start cooking, you have all your ingredients there. And what does it do? It cuts down your cooking time, but even more importantly, you're going to miss a key ingredient that's going to bring that final dish to uh, a great tasting meal. So, Chef, why don't we talk about mise en place? What do you have here? You've okay. got a pretty good size mise en place. Sure. So, <laughs> I'm pretty forgetful, so yeah. mise en place is important for me, and especially um, professional chefs working in restaurants when we're cooking for 200 guests in one night. If right. everything's not in its place, forget about it. Right. We're going to mess up. Right. Um, tonight, I have all of the mise en place for a few different steps here. First, we're going to demonstrate the brine for the pork tenderloin. Right. So we have, it's a honey brine. It's yeah. water, salt, honey, some black peppercorns, garlic, and aromatic herbs. Right. And then next to that, we're going to demonstrate the spetzel, which are like little dumplings. Right. And for that, we have flour, milk, eggs, sour cream. Oh, nice. Very simple. Yeah. And then to tie the whole dish together at the end, we have the other ingredients. Um, we have Brussels sprouts, which are in season now. We have some brown butter, Sweet. some fried sage, right. a little finishing salt. Uh -huh. And the final sauce I made ahead of time because okay. it took two days. Wow. So that's an apple cider reduction. Yeah. And then I have some poached apples there. Great. Uh, quick question. Did you say that you had a fried sage? I do, yes. Okay, and why would you fry your sage? Texture, flavor. Okay. Um, it's pretty. Yeah. So that's gonna be a garnish. Okay, excellent. So what did you do, saute it or in the oven? I deep fried it. Ooh, yeah. okay. So that's really bringing the oils out and mm -hmm. when you use that garnish. And salt. And salt, sure. okay. And then the brown butter, which is pretty Mm -hmm. Simple explanation. 
Sure, you put butter in a pan, apply right. heat until it turns brown. Right. Yeah, obviously you have to stop cooking it. Once it starts to turn brown, it, it becomes kind of nutty. Yeah. And right. um, if you go too far, it becomes black butter, right. which we don't want. Right. And that's an important uh, chef's tip right there. Mm -hmm. You know, butter has a very, I'm sure everybody realized, a very low smoke point. It melts very quickly. And you just want that golden, nutty, you don't even have to taste it to see if it is nutty because you'll burn your finger or your tongue, but you don't want to get cross over into that black butter because that's going to ruin your dish. Right. Okay. Now, one other thing we always talk about, do you use salted butter? I use unsalted. Right. You will never find salted butter in a professional kitchen. You will never find it in a professional bakery. Why? Because the chef has to season to his own taste mm -hmm. to bring that flavor profile that he feels his recipe needs. And one other thing before we start the cooking process, you have, you use sea salt, correct? Sure. And you have a flaked sea salt, is that right, correct? Yeah, we use a lot of different salts at the restaurant uh, depending on what kind of effect we want the salt to give the final dish. Right. Um, for most cooking, I'll use kosher salt for seasoning because right. it's a little coarse. You can actually see it yep. when you're seasoning your food right. and you can control the seasoning that way. Right. For seasoning water, if you right. want to make salted water to cook yeah. pasta in, I use yeah. iodized salt just because it's cheap and it right. dissolves fast. Yeah. Um, for finishing an entree, right. for a few little extra pops of salt, I'll use a flaky sea salt. Okay. Um, this one here, this is my personal favorite. It's, it's super, super flaky. Yeah. Um, this is Malden sea salt from England. Okay. And it, it has this really cool pyramid shape. Oh. So it has a little texture. Yeah. When you yeah. bite down into right. something with that little pop and that little yeah. crunch of salt, it's amazing. That's great. And one thing about in, in professional kitchens, they're using kosher salt, sea salt. This is one that I haven't seen a chef use before. We had a chef on that actually, actually collects salts from all over the world. But the benefits of a kosher a sea salt, better than your table salt to use. There's less sodium being used. Larger crystals, as chef gave you the tip, easier to control, okay, as opposed to a table salt. And also, I feel you have a much better finished flavor profile with a kosher or a sea salt than a table salt. Definitely. So. Those are a couple of tips for the home chef. And what else are we going to do here? We wanna, what are you going to start for a chef? Uh, first, I'm going to demonstrate the, the brine. Excellent. So this is a, um, this is a honey brine. Yeah. Um, first things first, high heat, because what we're doing here is a brine is a, it's really a salt solution right. that is going to add some salt and some flavor to the final product. Okay. So this is, this is just a quart of water. All right. Okay. Start off with our water, and then we're gonna add something for a little sweet. Right. I'm using some honey here. Yeah. And everyone likes a little sweet. Oh yeah. But you know, what he's doing here is, and you'll see this in Asian cooking, Everything is a balance. Mm -hmm. You have your sweet, you have your savory, uh, you may have uh, a sweet and then a pH, which is like a vinegar or lemon juice. So remember in your cooking that you're looking for balance. Sure. Okay. So there's our sweet. Right. Now we're adding our salty. Salt, right. So like you mentioned, this is kosher salt. Right. Then for our aromatics, yep. I'm going to add some, these are just crushed garlic cloves. Okay. I've already taken them out of the, the peel and right. just smashed them with the side so, of a knife. Right. So those go in. Yeah. And again with the aromatics, black right. peppercorn. Right. Wow. Not crushed, so it's not going to get too spicy, yep. but it's going to add a little right. bit of that spice right. to the final product. And then a little bouquet of some herbs here. Yeah. Uh, rosemary, thyme, parsley. parsley. Right. Into the pool. Yeah. Gets all happy. Right. All Excellent. we're going to do is bring it up to a boil. Yeah. This is for a demonstration purpose. Yeah. But at the restaurant, we actually do this two days ahead of time. Right. So we make a big batch and yeah. then we cool it down 
and we actually let it sit overnight with yeah. all of these aromatics in there right. to develop flavor. Right. And then when we put our pork in there, we leave that in again for another 12 hours. Wow. So this is something if you're going to do this at home, you want to plan this ahead, yeah. invite all your friends over, right. half the cooking's done ahead of time, right. and when they taste yeah. the final product, you know, right. they're going to think you're amazing. Yeah, so. and, and I, I'm glad, Chef, this is a great recipe. If you want to have a dinner party on a Saturday night, and generally everybody's working, and they're, they're family, they're running around with the kids. So here's the first step. One night you put this together, okay, let it sit for 24 hours, Mm -hmm. And then you add your pork for brining for 12 hours, mm -hmm. okay? A and, you know, it really speeds up your cooking time so that you can s obviously pay more attention to your guests. And it's one of those cool restaurant tricks that right. makes home cooking. It just like, brings it over the top. Right, right. Makes your food, gives it that sweet, that right. salty, that right. super flavorful. Yeah, finish. well, I, I didn't tell you, I've invited the audience that we have here tonight to your home for dinner yeah. next Sunday. Is that <laughs> My okay? My wife will be thrilled. Yeah, yeah. good, good. <laughs> Thank God she's a good cook. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take this off now. At this point, once it comes up to a boil, the honey is dissolved in there, the salt's dissolved. It's ready to just sit right. and develop those flavors. So this was, and we'll provide a, a recipe online, but this was one quart of water and uh, a cup of salt. Okay, yeah. So it's a lot of salt. Right. All of that salt is not going to be in your final product though. It's right. just gonna kind of infuse the outside of the protein. Right. Um, here we have, if, if I might, this is something cool I wanted to show everyone. This is a, a thermal immersion circulator. So this is a water bath. It's a temperature controlled water bath. And in here, I have my pork tenderloin that I already brined. I packaged in bags and it's slow cooking to a precise temperature. It's a 61 degrees Celsius. And that's gonna provide us with a perfectly cooked pork. Right. And we can do it without a hot oven here. Yeah, so. which is great in 61 Celsius. I hate to show off. It's about 145 degrees, roughly, to yeah. give or take. And it's not that I'm a great mathematician. I had the chef figure it out before we started the show. So, anyways, but this is great. I, I love this. And uh, this is actually a home use model. Sure. You yeah. know, so uh, it's great for the home cook. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can cook any protein to a yeah. precise temperature. You can do it ahead of time, and you mm. can hold them in there. They're not going to overcook. Right. They could yeah. sit in there for three hours while you're, you know, drinking wine with your guests at your right. dinner party. Yeah. And yeah. your protein's going to be perfect. Right. Okay, so the brine is done. Uh, next, I'm going to show us the, uh, the Spetzel batter. Oh, great. These little dumplings. Yeah. So this is, again, it's another simple recipe. Um, we're gonna start off with some all-purpose flour. Okay. Into, into a large mixing bowl. Right. Then we're gonna add some milk. This is just whole milk. All right. A little bit of salt. I'd say that's a two-finger pinch. Right. A couple of eggs. All right. Does it make any difference if they're large or extra large? In we use large eggs from a farm um, that's near my house up in Bedford. So I pick up eggs there, bring them right, to the restaurant. Right. And the farm eggs tend to be on the large side. So. Yeah. So spatzel is a middle European pasta, right? That's how I always look at it. Yeah, really similar to pasta. Right. And delicious, like yeah. pasta. Oh, sour cream. That was sour cream. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that, uh, that Eastern European flavor going in there, the right. sour cream. And you can see this comes together really fast. Yeah. This is so easy to do at home. Right. You're just making a batter, it's done. Great. And then at this point, <coughs> over here I have a salted simmering water pot. Right. Um, we're gonna force this through a sieve, yep. and it's gonna drop down into the water, mm -hmm. and then float up to the surface, 
and that's our final product. Right, and it's a very quick cook. I mean, you, it's a fresh product, so like fresh pasta, but this will probably cook in a minute, minute and a half, I would think. A minute at the most? Yeah, because you're actually, when you get to the uh, brown butters, the finished portion, you're gonna be putting it in the saute pan with the butter, is that correct? Exactly, we're gonna crisp it up right. in the brown butter. Which is nice, yeah. And, and this is a, you know, you don't really need a fancy piece of equipment. Uh, and Chef can show you what he's using. So I'm winging this. Um, they sell at those fancy restaurant uh, stores at the mall where they have all the really expensive, cute little gadgets. You can right. find a Spetzel maker. Right. It probably costs a fortune. Yeah. At home, you could use a colander, a pasta colander to right. do this. Right. At the restaurant, I grab a, this is called a hotel pan, perforated hotel pan. And this is what we use at the restaurant to do a giant batch of right. the Spetzel. Right. I'm going to make a small batch here. Yeah, as long as it but has a hole, this is about a quarter of an inch hole. Yeah, eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch hole. You could use the large holes on the side of a cheese grater if right. you wanted. Yeah. That would work too. So at this point, I oil whatever you're going to force your Spetzel through, if it's a colander or a grater. You want to oil it so the spetzel doesn't stick to it. Right, and Chef just gave you a great tip because I didn't think it through, and that will help it from clogging up or sticking to the top of the surface. Mm -hmm. So, great tip, Chef. Thanks. And now I'm just going to add the spetzel. I'm using a rubber spatula. Yeah. Do it in a, a couple small batches. If you add too much, it might go through the, the holes and then end up on your kitchen counter right. and bake to the side of your stove, which you don't want. Right. So is your water boiling It's heavy at a simmer. A simmer. It's definitely okay. simmering. Yeah. Now I'm just scraping it through. I wish I had a camera inside the pot, but I'll pull this off once it's through. And this is a dough cutter that I'm yeah. scraping here. Right. Yeah. You could use a pastry uh, scraper or, yeah, oh, this looks great. And you'll see this in just one minute. Um, you can see all, all the little, they almost look like uh, a little pasta or uh, long grain rice. Yeah, now I think Spetzel means little sparrows. Oh, okay. Don't quote me on that, but yeah. we can Google it later. Okay. Yeah. And you can see it's yeah. it's floating. Right. Once you drop it down into the simmering water, after about 30 seconds, it's ready to maybe 30 seconds to a minute. It's ready yeah. to come out. And I'm going to shock it in a um, in an ice water bath. That's why don't you explain to our viewing audience why you're shocking it as you're going along here? So shocking it is going to stop the cooking process or else it's going to turn to mush, and right. then we don't want that. Right. This is called a spider, this big right. thing. We call yeah. these a spider in right. restaurants. Mm -hmm. At home, you could use a, a, a slotted spoon. Right. A little pasta spoon. Yeah. A spider is a, is a, this one is square. I have three different size spiders myself that I use at home, and, but they're round. And in like in Chinese cooking with the wok, you'll see spiders, and it's really a great gadget. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this point, what we want to do is cool that down and then take it out of the water. Right. And okay. what we do at the restaurant is we lay it, we make it ahead of time. Yeah. We lay it out on a flat pan, yeah. and we oil it just like people oil right. pasta so it doesn't right. stick together. Yeah. And then as people order the Spetzel, it's a quick pickup. We get a hot pan, brown yeah. butter, right. into the pan, season right. it, and crisp it up. Yeah, and, and if this was uh, wrapped in a nice plastic wrap, you could hold that overnight if you wanted to. Oh, I definitely. Think, you know, a couple, maybe even a couple of days, so. Sure. It's, uh, we go through it so fast, that never happens. <laughs> right, yeah, which is great. Um, I believe you could also freeze Spetzel once it's cooled down. Oh. Excellent. And it could keep in the freezer. So I'm yeah. just going to switch this over here. Sure. Now we're getting ready to finish the, yeah. uh, the final product, bring right. everything together. Yeah. Now, uh, I always like to ask the, the chef of the week, uh, are you sourcing your 
well, we know you're sourcing your eggs locally, which sure. is great. Mm -hmm. So you're really getting fresh products and local products. But even your produce, seasonal, sustainable items, your whatever you're using yep. for herbs and you know vegetables, so it's sustainable. Yeah, we're using all sustainable products. Um, we get as much produce as we can from local farms, um, right. even animals, uh, pigs yeah. from uh, different farms in the area. Wow. Um, we grow our own herbs for nice. the restaurant. We yeah. have two kitchen gardens at the owner's property and at my property. So wow, great. Uh, we try to grow our own herbs. We try to source from local farms. Yeah. Um, we serve only sustainable seafood. Oh, great. Uh, so we don't serve any fish that's on the Monterey Bay Aquarium watch list. Right. And uh, right. we make everything from scratch. Yeah. So we're trying to do all the all the good things. All the good yeah. things. And I'm guessing your menu also ha is uh, hopefully allergy proof. You're offering sure. uh, options that mm -hmm. you know don't have nuts or other allergens. Yeah, the big one we see today is uh, gluten allergies. Right. So we have a gluten-free menu. Um, we also offer a vegetarian menu, a vegan menu. Wow. We do a tasting menu. Nice. Um, and then the regular menu. Wow, that's great. Yeah. yeah, it's great to hear that. And I know you, most of your restaurants today are very aware of, you know, people's eating needs. Yeah, and we have to be. Yeah. You have to be. Yeah. Uh, there's no excuse to pretend you're not educated about allergies and, right. and you know, in the day of uh, the Internet. <laughs> right. We know what people need and there's right. no excuse to not offer it. So. Right. Great. Okay, now. So at this point, um, I'm going to start heating up my sauce. Yeah. Now, again, this is something I can't demonstrate on the fly on the on the cooking show, but uh, this is a simple sauce to make at home. It's an apple cider reduction. Okay. Everyone loves apple cider this time of year. Yeah. So we reduced some apple cider by half, oh. and then finished it with a little bit of a dark chicken stock. Oh, nice. Which is a reduced right. chicken stock. Yeah. On the reduction piece, that's just letting it cook down generally by half. The other thing is a dark chicken stock, you know, you roast your bones, mm -hmm. and that's how you basically get a dark chicken stock. And you put a mirepoix, is the term, celery, carrots, onion. You're going to get a lot of flavor when your pan, when you start that cooking, this is a liquid that's already been reduced. But for instance, when he puts the pork in there, you want that pan hot. You want caramelization. That actually is part of the flavor building process. So do not be afraid of a hot mm -hmm. pan. Hot pans. Yeah. I always keep a hot pan on a really high burner at the restaurant, just yeah. ready to go. Right. And to this sauce, I'm going to add some, these are some poached apples. Uh -huh. we, have a, we have a forager who comes to the restaurant uh -huh. and he'll bring us really neat seasonal things. And he found these awesome apples. He calls them winter bananas because they're so sweet. Uh -huh. I, don't know the, I don't know the actual variety of apple, uh -huh. but we took that and we poached it in some simple syrup right. to make it a little sweet. Yeah, would you talk about the poaching, what that means for the home cook that may not? Sure, poaching is really just, cooking submerged in a liquid um, gently, right. you're not boiling, uh, you're cooking at a low temperature, like at a low simmer, and taking it out fairly quick. We're yeah. not cooking it to mush. Right. We're, this still has a little bit of texture, a right. little crunch. Yeah. yeah. Which is also part of your cooking process. You want different, what I call the bite, you, you know, you get the flavor, then you get a little bit of texture, so it's part of the whole eating process. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to warm that up in the sauce yeah. and right. turn, Initially, the, turn the temperature down chef, a little. You know, here's another tip Chef gave me earlier. This dish was going to be made with poached nectarines, correct? It was. Yeah, but the reason you didn't use nectarines... They are not in season anymore. Right. And they were two weeks ago, Yeah. you know, but, but Friday right. we placed our order for nectarines and no can do. Right. Um, but we have a great relationship with our produce company. So my buddy Leo at, at the produce company calls me up, hey, I don't have any nectarines. Yeah. And then we talk about what our options are. Right. 
And that's what we do at the restaurant. We change the menu constantly, yeah. depending on what we have, right. what's in season, what's available. Right. And that helps with creativity, just cooking with the seasons. Yeah, and, and Chef just gave you, which I think is a critical approach to cooking. It's about creative. It's an art form. And the more you do, obviously, the better your finished product is. But if you read a cookbook, you'll see a symbol many times that's just T T to taste. So don't be afraid to be creative. If it's lousy, your kids, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, they may throw it at you, but the next time you'll know to make a few changes. Okay? And uh, of course, with somebody as, as capable uh, uh, as Chef is, you're going to get a consistent product all the time. I still make mistakes, but I right. just try not to let them leave the kitchen ever. Right, <laughs> oh. right. And that's really part of cooking. I'm glad he said that. Everybody makes mistakes, even your best chefs. Yeah. The only mistake I say, if you make it, dump it. And that's if you burn garlic. It will absolutely destroy your meal. Okay, so other than that, mistakes are part of it. And let's see what we got going okay. here next. I'm just going to get my, I'm going to take my pork tenderloins out of the circulator. Mm -hmm. So at this point, these are essentially cooked to a perfect degree of doneness. Mm -hmm. And really all I'm going to do, and you talked about this, is sear the meat and how it adds flavor. Um, so it's, it's called a Maillard reaction. It's a changing of enzymes and chemical structures that wow. makes the food taste delicious. Right. Now, Chef, when, when you get this pan good and hot, mm -hmm. you're obviously going to put some sort of an oil in there, right? I am, yeah. Okay, what type of oil are you going to use? I'm going to start it with a uh, with vegetable oil. Okay. So remember in cooking, I love to cook with olive oil, E-V-O-O. -O. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful. First of all, it's expensive, far more expensive than a canola salad oil. But it has a, a low smoke point. Mm -hmm. So you have to get used to cooking with olive oil. Otherwise that oil will start smoking and it'll burn and obviously add a flavor you don't want. So when you mm -hmm. get into the canolas, the salad oils, higher smoke point and you'll be able to maintain your dish. And what's great about it, like a canola, there's really no flavor in that. Right. So I use a lot of extra virgin olive oil at the restaurant as well, yeah. but I tend to use it more for a finishing flavor. Finishing, right. Where I'm not going to be you know, losing that that awesome flavor right. in the dish. Right. So even if I start a dish with some vegetable oil, I might later on go in and drizzle some really delicious right. olive oil. Right. You can see that oil's already smoking. Oh yeah. It's a little yeah. too hot. So I'm just yeah. gonna turn it down. Yeah. Use your knob. It right. doesn't have to be on high all the time. Yeah, and, and here's a little bit of a tip. If all of a sudden you realize it's a little too hot, either turn it down or if you have something in there okay, that you've been cooking and you see that it's too hot, take it off. Set it to one side. Let it come down. Don't panic. Mm -hmm. You can always recover. Unless you burn the garlic, of course. Yeah. Now we're in trouble. Okay. So at this point, the pan's cooled down a little bit. Yeah. And we just want to season the pork. Now, you can see I put a little black peppercorn on there. Yeah. I actually didn't add any salt. Um, there's already enough salt in the pork from the brining process. Right. Yeah. You don't want to take, you don't want to add too much salt right. to your dish. Mm -hmm. um, you can always add more salt, right. but and you can never take it away. Exactly. And you know, Chef just gave you a great tip. If you, for, he has the brine which has salt in it, but if you're using something like a caper, remember that has salt in it. So as you're adding ingredients, think through if you need more salt. And I always feel that you're better off adding salt or pepper at the end if it needs it, okay? So this has some brine, it has salt, sear it, and then you can always taste it. If it needs a little finishing, then you can add your additional salt. But again, that's a two-taste situation. Watch that 
spitting a little spitting, bit. Yeah. <laughs> so right now we're just getting that that Maillard browning. Right. That nice color on there. And you'll see the honey that was in this brine. Yeah. It's going to help with the browning because right. the sugars Sugar. in that honey are going to caramelize. Right. And you can see it doesn't take long. Right. We're already getting some beautiful right. browning. Yeah. And in this particular method that Chef used with, with this uh, machine, that meat internally is at the right temperature. It's already cooked. It's already cooked. So what we're doing is gilding flavor through the browning or the caramelizing mm -hmm. or Maillard. You see, that's, that's what I'm looking for right there. Right, right. So I just want to talk about one thing, okay? How do you know when this is done? A professional chef has worked with enough protein, he can touch it, okay? Yeah, sure. And, and tell if this is cooked enough inside. So there is a very simple technique. It's the thumb to finger technique. If you go to the, your little finger in your thumb, feel that muscle, it's hard. That's well done medium well on the next finger, medium rare on the middle finger, and then your index finger, that's rare. So you can feel the difference. This starts you thinking through, you know, because you don't really want to cut into a meat and then lose all the juice out of it and then have to put it back because it's going to spoil the final dish. Okay. This is our brown butter. Excellent. That we had prepared ahead of time. Right. So now I'm adding the brown butter, and you can see I'm using one pan for this whole dish. Right. Now I'm going to cook the spetzel in here, yeah. which is cool, because yeah. especially if you're cooking at home. Right. Like I said before, I tried to do it ahead of time to cut down the cooking time and to be ready, but I also didn't want to overcook it. So now we're applying more heat. It's going to turn more brown at this right. point. You right. can even see it's yeah, in the it's, pan and it's starting, starting to get, to turn more starting brown. get brown. And you can, you can smell it, too. Right. It smells nutty. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, this is part of the planning process. He deliberately cooked it to this very yellow-golden color because he knew that he was going to put it back in a very hot sauté and it would finish that browning. So think through your recipe, mm -hmm. okay? And now, if you were to cook the brown butter from the beginning at home, I would say it really only takes two to three minutes yeah. on low heat. Right. Medium to medium low yeah, heat. Right. Now it, we're going to add the spetzel. Right, and that's something that can be done a couple of days in advance. Just refrigerate, right? That's what I did, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it helps your cooking time when your guests are uh, there. You can spend a little bit more time with them. Okay. Now the spetzel is in the brown butter. Yeah. I'm just moving the, the pan just to keep it from sticking. Sticking, sure. And now the spetzel doesn't have a lot of salt, so I'm just going to season it. A tiny touch of salt right, and a little touch of cracked black pepper. Excellent. And now I really just want to leave it right. and let it get happy and let it crisp up in the butter. Okay. Excellent. I don't want to move it around too much. Right. And that's another point. I remember when I was in culinary school, a very well-known chef, we were doing mushrooms, mm -hmm. okay, and I took the pan and I flipped them. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> Let them get a little bit crispy. So, and this is the same technique the chef is talking about. You don't want to move it around too much. I'm just peeking underneath yeah. on the corner to see how it's looking. You yeah. can see it's starting to brown a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But I do the same thing. I'm always telling my cooks to stop moving their pans around. Right. Just let it let it cook. Right. It's okay. It's okay to not move it for a couple minutes. Yeah, and if you do too many bad dishes, you'll be out the back door before you know it. No, I, I try to be good to them. That's They're good to me, so I'm good I, to them. I hear you. Yeah, not every chef. I, I don't even watch those shows where the <laughs> chef goes nuts on the, you know, these... TV shows. Yeah, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy cooking. Right, right. And you get nothing productive. But we had a chef on, and he was got very ill. And when he came back to work, the chef got mad and threw a sauté pan across <laughs> the commercial kitchen and hit him off the head. I have never really seen that happen anywhere. 
and yeah. yeah. You hear a lot of horror stories, but <laughs> although curtains become more professional these days, yeah, and that's a that's a really great thing. There's, right. you know. Kids go to college now. They go to school for more often four years now. It's become more of a, you know, a serious profession. Right. And um, kitchens yeah. have to be professional places now. So yeah, which is a very good point. And you know, I remember there's a very well-known chef. Uh, you'll see him on PBS, Jacques Copin, and he told me once when he started out in France, if you were a chef. You're at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. You are a used car salesman. Now, because of television, they're all celebrities. Yeah. And, and so it has changed quite a bit. Now, I do have a quick question. Mm -hmm. My Brussels? Brussels. Have they been blanched or what, what do you do? How do you prep those? So these Brussels sprouts, usually you see Brussels sprouts whole, round. Right. Um, what we do is we core them out with a paring knife oh. and then separate them just into the leaves. Yeah. So they're going to cook quickly, right. but they're also going to keep some texture. Yeah. And I hear a lot in the restaurant, people say, I don't like Brussels sprouts. Right. And wow. sometimes, but maybe I can, I can turn you into right. a Brussels sprout lover right. because this tastes amazing. Yeah. It's just, it's a, you know, you know how you blanch Brussels sprouts right. and they get all stinky and yeah. they're kind of soggy? Yeah. It doesn't happen when we separate it into the leaves. It's almost like a, yeah. like a crisp little piece of cabbage. Yeah, I mean. Right. And I have a question. When, when you said you go and take the core out, mm -hmm. what is the reason to take the core out? So In this case, we want the leaves to fall off. Oh, you do? So we're cutting the core out right. and then breaking it apart with our, with our thumbs. Oh, sweet. Okay. And now, at this point, the spetzel is... Brown. Brown. Right. It smells delicious. Yeah. It looks good. So I think we're doing okay so far. Great. I think it might need a little bit more yeah. salt. Yeah. And now I'm going to add the Brussels sprout leaves. All right. I'm just kind of pushing that, the spetzel up to the All front. Right. You know, Brussels I... Brussels sprout leaves in. Right. I can't imagine how many of these particular recipes you've made. But you notice Chef said, I'm going to put a little bit more salt in. And this is one thing about professional chefs. A lot of times they can tell just by looking mm -hmm. or the smell. Do not be afraid to take a spoon and taste that spatzel, okay? Then, because you're not doing it like a, a professional chef constantly. And then you can add your salt or whatever other ingredient you think it needs. We, we keep tasting spoons in the kitchen yeah. um, at work. We have little plastic spoons. Right. I, I want the cooks to constantly, constantly, constantly taste because you never know. It, things taste different one day from the next. Yeah. Just because someone made a salad dressing one day right. and it tasted good on Tuesday, it doesn't mean they're gonna come in on Wednesday and it's gonna taste the same. Yeah. You never know, so I always have them taste everything. Right. I'll tell you, if you wanna look at a great picture of Chef, as I was researching the restaurant, his picture comes right up. It's a great, it's a very engaging, uh, uh, a uh, picture of chef, and it made me want to really dig into what kind of nut would let somebody take a picture like this. But ah. that, that's not true. No, it, it's really cool. So, chef, uh, what point here? Because we're getting close to our cook time here. Yeah. What should be done to finish this? This is essentially done. Okay. Because the Brussels sprouts are just very thin leaves, yeah. they really don't have to cook long. Okay. Um, you can see they're starting to become a little yeah. translucent yeah. Nice. and get a little soft, right. but we still want them to have a little bit of texture. Bite. Yeah. yeah. Texture. And you can okay. see they're turning a nice, vibrant, bright green, right. whereas before right. they were kind of dull looking. Yeah. Okay. Once you have that nice green color, mm -hmm. they start to wilt a little bit, but not too much. Yeah. I'm ready to move on to the plate. Excellent. So I have a nice big platter here. Yeah. So we can plate this family style. Oh, that's great. And really simple, not fussy. And you can hear this is still cooking. Yeah. That's carryover cooking. Yeah. Something that we talk about in restaurants a lot. Right. Just because you turn the heat off. You know, it doesn't mean it's done cooking. It's going to continue to Right, to because cook. it's still hot. 
Yep. Okay. So there we have our spetzel. Yeah. And now I'm just gonna do a few slices of the pork tenderloin. You can see that's it's a beautiful doneness. Yeah. Now you're cutting this at an angle or on the bias? I'm cutting it on the bias just so it looks pretty so we can fan it out. Fan it out, right. Okay. And presentation is important if you have company. And even with your family, they're going to say, gee, honey, you are terrific. Hopefully. <laughs> if you did a good job. Or you could say, honey, I'm sick of you staying home. You're supposed to be the breadwinner. I don't care how good the food looks. Get a job. Right. And now I'm going to finish it with this apple cider reduction Ooh, with some poached God. apples. And this is a really awesome fall dish. Oh, yeah. And it smells fantastic, chef. Thank you. Excellent. And with that reduction, you're getting a real sauce effect because it's thickening. Mm-hmm. Now that is your sage. Some fried sage. Yeah. Just a couple flakes of the Malden finishing salt. Wow. And a couple micro herbs. Oh, nice. Just, just to make it cute. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> well, what does the audience think of that dish, huh? Great. Great. Well, we want to thank you, Chef. We're really pleased you were here. And I'll tell you, I notice people are putting their bibs on, so they're <laughs> dying to taste this food as, as well as I am. Uh, and I want to thank, uh, again, the uh, Mother Brook Arts and Community Center on High Street in Dedham. If you like art, you'll love Mother Brook Communi Arts and Community Center. And we want to thank Zebra, Wine Bar, and Bistro. Zebra's oh. Bistro and Wine Bar. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. I'm sorry. Bistro or Wine Bar first. Either way, yeah. you're going to get a good right, meal. Right, right. And great reviews on you, Chef, and your restaurant. So we really appreciate you coming. So thank you, and we'll see you again next week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Wine Pairing. We are filming at One Bistro, located at Four Points by Sheridan in Norwood. Today, I am with Miguel Escobar. He is the wine director and general manager of One Bistro. Today, I gave him the task, homework, <laughs> to choose a wine with Chef Brendan Pelley's, he's from Zebra's Bistro and Wine Bar. He made a honey brined pork tenderloin with lots of ingredients. So, so he had so many great ingredients, I was wondering what type of wine would you choose? White or red? So I think it's red, right? Sure. Yes, it is, Carol. So oh, thank you. So today we have yet another Oregon wine. Oh. But this time, oh you do seem to know my love of Oregon wine by <laughs> this point in Willamette Valley. We have an Oregon Pinot Noir. So this is Lemelson Six Vineyards. So mm -hmm. this is a Pinot Noir, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to find in a lot of places. But it's basically what's called a cuvee in the wine world. So it's a blend. So cuvee means blend? Yeah, so okay. it's a blend of six individual vineyard sites, hence the six vineyard designation on it. Wow. So they're really pulling from different AVAs. And as we went over last time, mm -hmm. an AVA is an American viticultural area. So they're in Willamette Valley. Start taking notes. Uh, yes, and it's uh, <laughs> so uh, this is a little bit of Shahalem, a mountain AVA. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of Dundee, Yamhill, Carlton, but really mostly Shahalem Mountain. So you mm -hmm. get that beautiful dark fruit, that ferrous color and extraction mm. on it. Uh, it's a beautiful wine. It's done 16 months in oak, uh, French, new and old. Uh, Anthony King is the winemaker, really great, fabulous winemaker. Uh, Lemelson has a great uh, history, really, I should say. Oh, and tell me. Ties to Massachusetts. Uh, you will find a Lemelson lab at MIT. Uh, uh, Lemelson ah. holds a lot of patents, and his son started this winery, but his father holds a lot of very important patents and uh, engineering uh, labs at MIT named after him. So there's kind of a tie with the East Coast wow. in a lot of ways. That's so cool. But let's uh, go ahead and try this wine, sure. if you will. So yes, you mentioned the ingredients. So pork and Pinot Noir to me are really a wonderful pairing, as is duck. Uh, it's probably two of my favorite things to have with Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Pinot Noir and turkey are also 
wonderful oh. friends. So not only is this wine be good for Chef Pelly's um, pork tenderloin, but you also suggest having this with duck and turkey? I would say yeah. duck, pork, turkey. Oh. Uh, and we'll get to find That's out why time. when we taste and smell yes. it. So as we went over last Great time, color. we swirl, we get those uh, polyphenols going mm -hmm. in the glass, have it open oh. up. Smells Beautiful nice. nose. So you get a lot of that Ooh. cranberry, mm -hmm. dried fruit, a little bit of spice note in the back. Mm -hmm. Very characteristic, very varietally correct and characteristic of the AVA we're sourcing from. It has light tannins, hardly exactly. any. Exactly. That's a great point. So people associate red wine with having Tons. big tannins, mm -hmm. you know, it's overpowering. Pinot Noir actually has four times the tannin of Cabernet uh, in the seeds. Mm -hmm. So I like this red. It's a beautiful red though, mm -hmm. not too big. Again, acidity being a very important part of food and wine. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the fish with lemon on it and the mm -hmm. wine that has acid, right. both really brighten, highlight the dish right. and really give it a little bit more prolonged finish. Alcohol, if you notice, is not very high either. I agree with you on that They one, do yep. a great job at controlling mm -hmm. how ripe the fruit is and when they pick it. And we went over bricks oh, yeah. last time and when you pick and when you harvest. Right. Great example of that. And really the wine is this beautiful, oh, beautiful, beautiful it's nose. Beautiful color. Really speaks to what Oregon Let's wines really like are. Let's have a like this. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel, excellent job. Well, cheers. cheers, Carol. Thank you so much for choosing a great wine. Thank you, always Perfect. a pleasure. So everyone, this has been this week's Wine Pairing. I'm Carol O'Connor. This is Miguel Escobar. He's the wine director and general manager of One Bistro. And we'll see you next week. Hello everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table Series restaurant interview. I am in downtown Medfield, Massachusetts and I am here with Executive Chef Brendan Pelly of Zebra's Bistro and Wine Bar. Brendan, thank you for being on the interview segment with me today. It's my pleasure. Um, I haven't been here in a couple of years but I know mm -hmm. a lot of changes. I love, I love animal print. I love zebras, I like cheetah and I really like it's classically done. I like the earth tones that you had mentioned. It's beautiful. Thanks. And all the light fixtures and stuff like that. Yeah, we um, we just wanted the decor in the restaurant to be kind of earthy and mm -hmm. match the farm to table theme oh, of the yeah, restaurant as a true. whole. Yeah, and it's very calming in here, which I like. And tell me how the name came about, Zebras. Uh, Zebras was actually named by the owner, uh, Craig Newbecker's son, Troy, mm -hmm. when Troy. he was just a little guy. He was five years old. So. And what did he say? Like the his father say, well, should I name the restaurant? Like <laughs> I, at the dinner I, table or I something? think that's how it went down. Oh, really? So, yeah. And um, how long has the restaurant been here? The restaurant has been here for, I want to say, about 14 years now. Wow. And you've been here for how many? Uh, going on three. Three. So tell, you have a very great, interesting culinary background. Tell me about it. Like, how did you get into, um, you know, cooking? Uh, I started when I was a teenager working in coffee shops and you know oh, wow. like the local friendlies yep. and <laughs> a local uh, like a local mom and pop restaurant mm -hmm. so I did everything I was a, a bus boy I was a dishwasher mm -hmm. I was the waiter I was a you know a fry cook then I worked in pizza shops um, wow. eventually in college yep. I started to realize that I really loved cooking and it wasn't just a job, and mm -hmm. I got my first job in an upscale restaurant, and um, I quickly moved up the ladder from a prep cook mm -hmm. in a fancy restaurant to a line cook. A couple years later, I was a sous chef, and um, so wow. it's all history from there. And now you're here. I am. That's perfect. Yeah. Now, when you came in three years ago, did you change a lot of the um, dishes on the menu? Or yeah. did you like tweak them to like, to bring it more like um, um no it was a slow change yeah. so i wouldn't scare all of the regular Smart. customers away yeah that's a lot but, of chefs say but eventually it's really been a 100 percent makeover mm -hmm. um the food is completely different mm -hmm. you know like i mentioned the farm to table theme mm -hmm. everything made from scratch we have our own um charcuterie program we oh, wow. we do a new england cheese program yeah house made pastas um Wow, that's a lot of work. And the menu changes wow. with the seasons constantly. Perfect. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And how often you open? Uh, we're open seven nights a week mm -hmm. for dinner only. Mm -hmm. We open at five o'clock, mm -hmm. five to ten. And I, I visited your met your website, and I liked um, you have events here sometimes, mm -hmm. like cooking classes and. 
something like that? We do a lot of different events. This time of year, we have the uh, gingerbread house <gasps> classes oh, coming yeah, up. Oh, I saw that. So this is a really big thing, mm -hmm. and it's for parents to do with their kids. They build oh. a gingerbread house together yep. um, with the pastry chef, mm -hmm. and you know, it's a really good time. We have the Christmas music playing and oh. candy everywhere Everyone and frosting everywhere. Oh, that's fun. So we do those classes. Yep. We do special wine dinners. We have uh, we have wine makers come mm -hmm. to be guests at the wine dinners, beer dinners, um, oh, beer. grilling dinners. Yeah, we do a lot of fun yeah, things. Yeah, beers are huge now, big time. Um, yep. Now, how many? covers do you have? How many seats do you have here? Um, we can fit about a hundred oh, wow. people at any given point. Yep. And yep. I noticed when I was driving up, you, could, you also have outdoor seating. We do. We have an outdoor patio. When it's in season. Of course. <laughs> yep. When it is warm enough. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. And you have a full box. I, now I noticed mm -hmm. the ambiance of the lounge. So is, could yep. people sit there and have dinner? Or is it mostly like drinks, maybe like appetizers? No, a lot of people dine, have a full dinner mm -hmm. in the bar in the lounge. Um, it's one menu throughout the entire restaurant. Oh, which is so great on it you. is more of a wine bar mm -hmm. feel in there. So people don't feel like they have to have you know a three course meal. People can come in, just have a few snacks, have some cheese and charcuterie have a couple glasses of wine, right. or they can sit down and they can make an evening out of it yeah. and have dinner. Yeah, it's very cozy. I like the li mini little couches and the pillows. Mm -hmm. Very cozy. Yeah, like it. It, we want it to feel like a like a cozy living room. Yeah, love it, love it. So, Brendan, thank you so much for being on the restaurant interview segment with me. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And Joe and I, my co-host of the show, we're definitely going to um, take a trip out here because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful downtown area, cozy and warm just like you in the restaurant. Oh, shucks. Thank Thanks you. so much. You're welcome. So everyone, this is Carol O'Connor of the Chef's Table Series, and this has been the restaurant interview segment with executive chef Brendan Pelly of Zebra's Bistro and Wine Bar. And we'll see you next week. So right now we're just getting that, that Maillard browning. Right. That nice color on there. And you'll see the honey that was in this brine yeah. is going to help with the browning because right. the sugars yeah, in that honey are going to caramelize. Right. You can see it doesn't take long. Right. We're already getting some beautiful right. browning. Yeah. Micro herbs. Oh, nice. Just, just to make it cute. Yeah, excellent. Well, what does the audience think of that dish, huh? Great. The Chef's Table Series is shooting on location in cities and towns across Massachusetts. If you would like to suggest your favorite restaurant or attend a live taping of the show, please visit thechefstableseries.tv.